agent will find out. Where is the noun phrase? Where is the verb phrase? And it will start understanding the meaning. What is written? The way we do that. Similarly, this is about NLU. NLU means natural language understanding. It will understand what is written. And other ways, like if NLG means a natural language generation. So if you show a picture of a doctor examining a patient, it will understand what's happening and it will tell you, it will speak or it will write for you that here the doctor is examining the patient. So it has understood what's happening and it is generating it in a natural language that is a sentence. So easy to do. If you are a data scientist, you contribute in all of these areas. I'm just told about two. There are many. Uh, as I said, the healthcare community. Uh, and anyway, I, I'm, I'm skipping the videos for the time being. As I said, our focus will be more on data science. So, But I'm introducing because many of you are attending any AI or data science uh, training for the first time. So I'm just trying to give you a little bit brief overview. Then you have robots. Again, intelligent agents. So here, the difference between AI programs and robots is Robots are able to take an action on the environment. They are able to make changes in the environment. Yeah. So they can walk, talk, you know, they can lift, etc. Uh, yeah, so that was about one. Another, you know, which is more interesting now, hot topic nowadays, neural networks, artificial neural network, con you know, ANN, CNN, RNN. So there are three types of neural networks which are very, very popular. So let's look at what is uh, artificial neural network. You know, some of you might, must be remembering in your biology class in eighth or ninth standard, we learned uh, uh, how the human brain uh, uh, looks like, looks like in the sense that there are cells, uh, tissues, right? So dendrites, exons, and synapses, okay? And the exon is covered with myelin sheath. Now, these are some biological, uh, biology lessons you, you must have learned about. This. Now, how a memory is created? The dendrites accepts the input. They pass on to the next. You see, basically, there are multiple neurons, millions of neurons, billions of neurons. So the, the, the memories get stored there in the neural pathways. So just for an example, teacher tells you in the, in the classroom, someone told you in the beginning, in your childhood, this is a pen. So this, this information got stored in some of your few, maybe thousands of neurons in your brain. Next day, the teacher again told you this is a pen or someone else told you this is a pen. So what happened? There's a myelin sheath on the exons. You know. It got thickened because now it is reinforced. You know. it's like same information is being told by multiple people. So this memory becomes, a, 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 it, it, it deepens the memory. You know, what, what to say. Like it, it, becomes, it becomes a belief after some time. So anyone says this is a pen, it is a pen. That's what you start believing it's a pen. Someone says, no, it is not a pen. This is something else. You say, no, it is a pen. This becomes a belief. That's how our memories and beliefs are formed. Now, what if I do the same thing with our machines as well? So that has been done. So silicon and wires, they act like living neurons and dendrites. And a very, very interesting topic. Uh, maybe I'll try to show uh, glimpses of uh, some videos, how actually things take place. This is very easy nowadays you know, to create artificial neural networks. First of all, although uh, you might uh, learn a lot of uh, today's statistical stuff, a little bit of so-called scientific stuff, etc. But when you are, a, when, when you are you know, applying the data science, when you're creating applications, the good news is everything is automated nowadays. Even the programming is automated. We do learn Python. When you learn data science, we learn uh, a language called Python. And it is so easy. If time permits, 
maybe uh, as I got promised, I think I'm looking at the uh, wall clock. Um, we have uh, two hours time. So first one hour or one, one hour, 10 minutes, I'm going to talk very, very basic concepts. And then after that, I will, um, I'll invite one of my colleagues who is actually working on multiple AI applications and uh, he will show you some of the use cases. So just to tell you, although the things may look complicated, but when you undergo a training program on data science, it's like everyone's cup of tea. The applications are wonderful, but the process of creation of applications is not that difficult. That is why there are a large number of data scientists being created in the world today. So in the artificial neural network, what happens is we also make the agent learn in the same way in the way the humans learn. There are different types of learning. I'll, I'll talk about them uh, very shortly. But let me give a very, very simple uh, uh, as a explanation of this, what exactly it is. See, there is an input and there are multiple layers. Now you can add any number of layers, one or two or three, it's your choice. And in those websites where uh, you can even experiment in our training programs, we ask you to experiment. Add one layer, add two layers. Is the machine learning faster? Sometimes it learns faster with one layer. Sometimes it learns faster with two layers. So <laughs> what do we mean by layers? I think let me show this video at least. <laughs> I'll come back to this. Yeah. I'll come back to these slides, but let, let me show you this. Since are they linked together? Right now, when I say neuron, all I want you to think about is a thing that holds a number, specifically a number between zero and one. It's really not more than that. For example, the network starts with a bunch of neurons corresponding to each of the 28 times 28 pixels of the input image, which is 784 neurons in total. Each one of these holds a number that represents the grayscale value of the corresponding pixel, ranging from 0 for black pixels up to 1 for white pixels. This number inside the neuron is called its activation, and the image you might have in mind here is that each neuron is lit up when its activation is a high number. So all of these 784 neurons make up the first layer of our network. Now jumping over to the last layer, this has 10 neurons, each representing one of the digits. The activation in these neurons, again some number that's between 0 and 1, represents how much the system thinks that a given image corresponds with a given digit. There's also a couple layers in between, called the hidden layers, which, for the time being, should just be a giant question mark for how on earth this process of recognizing digits is going to be handled. In this network, I chose two hidden layers, each one with 16 neurons, and admittedly, that's kind of an arbitrary choice. To be honest, I chose two layers based on how I want to motivate the structure in just a moment, and 16, well, that was just a nice number to fit on the screen. Okay, for some of the beginners, it might be looking a little uh, confusing. So, uh, to, to don't worry. Let me give a simple example first. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll, I'll show this again. Because some of you might, those who are especially new, totally new. Okay. Uh, let's take a simple example. Okay. Let's say that uh, you know I want to you know create a, uh, make an agent which can predict when the person whether the person who's entering into a, a say a shop or a say retail store he's going to buy or not buy. Okay. So what happens? I'll create certain uh, features. Maybe the person's. I'm just taking some you know wild example and don't you know. Don't think too much. <laughs> I'm just taking. So, so for example, 
a person, uh, uh, let's say, first of all, maybe I can say whether the person gender, gender is one of the factors which might uh, affect uh, whether the person is going to buy or not. Then I can predict the age. You know, it could, there could be various me means of uh, you know getting the age. I can ask loyalty cards. They say that through that I'll capture all the information. But for the time being, don't worry about how I'm catching getting those information. So age, or uh, uh, maybe I feel I feel the height also impact. Maybe I don't know height. It may or it may not. And what else? Uh, you uh, know, the costume, costume may be also impacting, maybe, right? And I want to know whether the person is going to buy or not buy. So, what happens? We had different functions. So, we add certain layers. Now, these are just increasing the permutations and combinations between all the factors. So basically, a person who is a male, okay, with the age of a certain age, you know, the age group would be, we'll have to divide that age group. I find with a certain height, with a certain costume, typically they always buy. And not always, 70% of the time they buy. That's what my data suggests. That's how I have observed. Similarly, I will try to get all the permutation and combination. And that's very easy. When I'm dealing with machines, all these permutation combinations are very, very easy to create. And what will happen once I have got all the information, once I make the machine learn, after some time, based on the inputs received for from maybe 100, 200, 500, 1000 data samples, I will be able to predict May, I'll be able to create a model which is able to predict whether the person is going to buy or not. So, ultimately, what will be the end result? A person who's a male at the age of 32 with a height of 5 feet uh, 6 inches and having a, let's say, shirt and trousers, that's a costume. I can predict based on the previous data the likelihood of this person buying from my shop is 0 0.8. It means 0 to 1, always likelihood of probabilities between 0 to 1. By the way, you learn probability also in our data science courses. You have to learn a lot of things. But we teach in a way so that you will understand. There is no background required. It's not that you have to have a mathematical background or an engineering background to become a data scientist. No. Everything is done by... No, everything is automated nowadays. Even in Python, uh, I will teach you, uh, I think there's time. So I'll teach you some basic algorithms like regression, multiple regression. The good news is, although I will teach you today, I'll, I'll try to teach you that algorithm and I'll tell you how to create those models. But let me also tell you that uh, you don't have to actually create those models. You can call these functions. Nowadays, there is a provision. The call the regression function, it will do everything for you. But you should know that you have to call regression function. So that is the only information you do need today. So everything is allowed is automated. By the way, my team is informing. One more thing information is that if you stay till the end of the session, you will get a free workshop certificate too. Yeah. So that's something new. Okay. <laughs> well. Generally, we charge something for the certificate. But anyway, this time it's free. So if you attend the full workshop, you will be getting a introduction to data science certificate today. In fact, it should be AI and data science because I'm, I'm also covering AI as well. But AI and data science is very, very highly correlated. So that is why uh, uh, you, you need to learn all these things. So, so coming back to that video, an artificial neural network. I hope it's, I'm not making it too complicated. Although it's the first day introductory, generally I will avoid all these things, but I'm taking a chance. So here we piece. How how I'm able to how I'm able to make my uh, uh, you know uh, uh, agent identify or recognize the numbers. 
how i am able to recognize so i'd like to show you you know one very well, let's 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 look at this this mechanism yeah let's... it's paired with another loop down low a4 basically breaks down into three specific lines and things like that now in a perfect world we might hope that each neuron in the second to last layer corresponds with one of these subcomponents that anytime you feed in an image with say a loop up top like a nine or an eight there's some specific neuron whose activation is going to be close to one and i don't mean this specific loop of pixels the hope would be that any generally loopy pattern towards the top sets off this neuron that way going from the third layer to the last one just requires learning which combination of subcomponents corresponds to which digits of course, that just kicks the problem down the road, because how would you recognize these subcomponents or even learn what the right... Oh, anyway, a little bit, this video is uh, from our, one of our advanced level uh, explanations. But just to tell you that all these possibilities do exist. And the best part about this is, in human brain, it is very difficult to erase the memory or a belief, change the belief. Even if you are wrong, still you keep believing something. But in machine... You can easily erase something. Wrong information has been fed. You can easily erase. This is the best part of you know, dealing. Uh, now coming back to <coughs> the, using the same logic, I can train a machine. So I can show different types of, let's say, animals or labeled photos. And after some time, machine will start learning and recognizing the pictures too. The way you see Facebook recognizing your picture. You know, if you if someone posts your picture somewhere, it will tell you that your picture has been posted somewhere and the person resembles like you. And usually you'll find that if you're posted by your friend, usually it's you only. So all this is part of AI applications. Now, have, having understood this, now let us understand how AI and data science is correlated. Okay, so let me talk about that first. <coughs> Okay, uh, let me take, uh, just give me one minute if I can share a video. <clears throat> just a minute, give me a soft face. Yeah, so I think this will be a good idea. It will speed up my whole process. Let me take help of my own video. ...of AI in healthcare. So let me talk some terminologies which you will hear from uh, many uh, data scientists. So now let us see, this is, if I consider AI. So if I say this is AI, now when I'm talking about AI, Do you remember what is AI? Anyone remembers the AI definition which I told you in the beginning? So I can say enables, it enables us to, it enables the machine to think like, think like human being. Sometimes I can say behave like human being also. So AI applications is our aim we are to, to develop an AI. Let's, let, for example, let's take an example, driverless car. 
Now, driverless car is an AI application. Right? Within that, we have got expert system, we have got uh, uh, NLP, etc. And within that, we also have got machine learning. Yeah. Within that, we have got, yes, Omar, simulate human intelligence, absolutely. ML, machine learning. Now, what is machine learning? Machine learning is about statistical tools to explore the data. Statistical tools to explore the data. Okay. means I use labeled data, labeled data, and I train the machine using the labeled data. And after some time, machine will start predicting. I will just take an example. Suppose I show you one data like here. So we call them as features like blood pressure, glucose, BMI, age. Based on that, person, person has diabetes or not. Let us say one represents diabetes and zero represents no diabetes. Okay. So this is known as labeled data. I have got a labeled data. So what I can do, I have got, let's say, lots of data with me. I can divide the data. Means I'm just showing four here. There can be 400 as well. So I'll divide the data into, let's say, 60 to 70% of the time. I will use the data, 60 to 70% of the data, I will use to train my machine. Uh, let, let me take a simple example because many of you may not be, uh, may, may get overwhelmed with so much of data. Let me take a simple example. I give you, let us say, a simple data. Experience of a person in the, let's say I'm talking about, let's say nurses, experience of nurses or hospital staff, let's say. And let's say age. Now I collected some data. So person with let's say zero years of experience, age is 22. 10 years of experience, 32. By the way, anyone who's attended my uh, black belt training before here? Is there anyone who has attended my black belt training before? Okay, no problems. So let me, uh, uh, yeah. So here, age and I'm taking very, very simple example. Now, this is a labeled data. Now, I can collect a lot of data like that. Maybe people from experience of five years, six years, 10 years. And I divide this data into uh, two or three parts, just to make it simple, let us divide it into two parts. One is training data. So I use some data to train, some data to validate my model. Now, the reason I'm using a simple data and simple example, because all of us and most of us, I still uh, you know, I assume, uh, must be remembering, if you go back to the school days, that if I have got the data like this, we call this as continuous data. Continuous means the numbers, uh, 0, 0 0.1, 7.8, .8, something like that. Both are data, with both the data are continuous data. I can fit this data into this model, which is known as a straight line, model of a straight line. So if I plot this data, this is the age, this is the experience, and if I plot the data, what will happen? Zero years experience, I am at 22. 10 years experience, I am at 32. 20 years experience, I am at 42. 30 years experience, I am at 52. Now, let me tell you. My years of experience is 32. Can you guess my age? My years of experience, now, can you predict my age? 
my experience is 32. What is my age? Fifty-four years, Allah, you're right. What happened was, this data was used to, to train, let's say, your mind, and you created. See, this is a this we call it as algorithm. This is known as algorithm. Algorithm. This is known as algorithm. Now algorithm, based on this algorithm, what will happen? Okay, one of the question was here, yes, uh, more data. Yes, more data, it will increase. Yeah, uh, More data will give you accurate results. Uh, you, absolutely right, Arva, you're writing. More data will give you accurate results. And uh, 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 yeah, I wouldn't go into the very much detail because I want to keep the thing simpler here today. So uh, yeah, but there is something called residuals and standard error. And by the way, all these things are very easy to, uh, uh, you know, if you use Python, you don't have to, I'm just showing you some uh, equations, etc. You don't have to really know these equations these equations are like for our my you know I, i'm trying to explain the concept that is why i'm using uh, using this equation so this is an algorithm and based on this algorithm after getting trained in the existing data i can create a model what will be the model look like model would look like age is equal to and if i just see the value of A is what will be the value of Y when the X is zero. If I make X is zero, what will be the value of Y? It will be 22. And what will be the value of B here? It will be one. Means one year experience increase is going to increase my age by one year. So it will be one. So my equation will be this. Now this I took a lot of uh, you know, time. I just did my. Uh, you know, if 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 you go back to some some statisticians, they can do all these calculations. But you don't have to do this. You this is no longer required anymore. You just identify. Looking at the data, you identify. Oh, this is a regression problem. We call it as regression problem. I have got some output data, which I label as Y, and I have got certain features. This is a regression problem. What I can do? I will just call a function in my Python language. I'll just call a function. Uh, in a way, let's say, Mr. Python, can you please do regression? Because I have to just identify. See, the only application of mind from our side is I should be able to identify the algorithm which is applicable to here. And suppose even if you are not able to identify, just try out other every algorithm, whatever fits in. So this is a regression problem. As once you get trained in, uh, in data science, uh, you know you'll very easily identify this is an this is a regression problem. So once you identify the regression, you can call that regression function and you can create this model. This model will be created automatically and you can then test the model. You can, so you have divided the data into training mod, training data, then you can validate this and then you can test it. And once you find the test results are really, really good, means there was one, ex, uh, like someone with 32 years of experience and you said it is 54 and actually i am 53.5 very very little difference and similarly you have got a lot of differences residuals we can say residuals or errors we call it as errors also so if I, my errors is very very low that means this model is a good model and i can use this for prediction sorry i can use this model for prediction so now i need only experience 
I can predict the age. I just took an example. Now I can, we call this as labeled data because there was labels and we call these as features. The experience, I can, like that. There, there might be one person who's 10 years experience and I predict he's 32, but he says I am uh, 37. Then I ask him what happened and he said, I took a break. I took a break in between. So I will introduce one more feature here, which is the break time. So here break would be, I think, yeah, break would be five years. And then I can not, I don't have to do any changes. The, the Python will do every, all these changes. And I will just put one more variable here that is break time. Or maybe let me introduce one more. And when I have got multiple variables, I will say I am using multiple regression. So here I have got one more variable. Let us uh, let me include. Okay, let me include one more. One person, I, uh, let's say, no break, ten years experience. I predict the age as thirty-two, and this person says no, I am thirty-seven. Then I further investigate, and this person is a physician, because physicians generally. You know, till the age of 27, their experience is zero. So I just put one more variable, profession. So here I am saying no physician. This is not a physician. No physician. No physician. Not a physician. But here the last one is physician. So I have introduced one more variable that is physician. So I will just machine will add. I I don't have to do. Machine will automatically detect it because I have told machine, please do a regression, multiple regression. Just by just writing a function, we just say call a function. There are certain libraries available in Python. Uh, we have got uh, the names of these libraries are NumPy, Scikit-Learn, Pandas, TensorFlow, uh, which you know you can learn in like, as I said, in just hundred hours of training, you can master all these things. And it's very easy. It's not difficult at all. You don't have to have any IT background. You don't have to have any uh, mathematics or statistical background. You just need to identify the algorithm. That's it. It's very easy to identify nowadays. So I will just add and I'll just put one more variable here. This becomes now new equation for my prediction. Now I will ask a person, okay, can you tell me how many years of experience? I have 10 years of experience. Did you take any break? No. Are you a physician? Yes. So physician becomes one. Yes. Then you are 22 plus 10 plus five years. So that means you are 37. So I have started predicting. Similarly, this was the output was in continuous format. I used regression and multiple regression. Now suppose my output is in, let us say, here the outcome is uh, in let's say person is having diabetes yes no yes no yes my output is in the categorical format when it is in category format i cannot use regression or multiple regression i will use logistic regression let me tell you that as well. I hope you were able to understand regression and multiple regression. Just if you can write yes, if it was not complicated, then I can do further <laughs> logistic regression also. And let me talk about logistic regression. So logistic, uh, let, 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 me keep me, uh, let, uh, let me keep it simple. So let's say age and person having diabetes. Age is 10 years. I've got, I person did not have any diabetes. Uh, age 15 years, no. Uh, 20 years, no. 25 years, no. 30 years, no. But there are 30 years, I have got one person with diabetes as well. Now I'm just keeping it very, very simple. In reality, you'll get 20 samples of 10 years, 30, 40 samples of 15 years, and so on and so forth. Uh, 40 years, no. Uh, 40 years, yes. 50 years, yes. 
50 years, yes. 50 years, no also. And then 60 years, I, you know, this data is just imaginary data. So please uh, take it that way. Yes, 80 years, yes. 80 years, maybe one, one person is no also. 80 years, yes. Now, if I want to make a graph of such a data, and I'm doing a little fast, I hope uh, it's not uh, complicating the matters. But what I will do, the output is here is yes or no. The output here is yes or no. So I'll put it as 0 and 1. Okay. So we have got uh, here age. And here I have got the diabetes, yes or no. I can put either 0 as yes or no, I, whichever way I choose. That, that doesn't matter. So for example, at the age of say 5 or 10, no diabetes no means zero and yes means yes let's put that way so no diabetes at the age of 10 let's say i'm just 30 40 50 60 70 so i will get data if i represent something like this i hope you are able to uh, get what i'm trying to do here so as the age increases, I've got more of yeses. Some, sometimes, you know, a little bit outliers will be there. I can predict. Here, here I had used a straight line. Here I had used a straight line. Here I cannot use a straight line. We will use something called this S curve. I can, okay, let me ask you one thing. What is the probability of a person getting a diabetes if the age is five? Can you tell me? Z between zero to one. What is your guess? What is your guess? Age person who is getting age is five is zero. Yes, and ten again zero. What is the probability of a person getting uh, diabetes if the age is seventy? Between zero to one. J usually probabilities expresses zero to one. It is one. I think. So, and what is the probability of a person getting uh, the diabetes at the age of 40? Between 0 to 1, can you tell me any number? Just make a guess. It is 0.5. Yeah, so what is happening here is I am getting an S curve. This is known as logistic regression. Yeah, and because it's binary 0 to 1, so I will call it binary logistic regression. So what is my job as a data scientist? I have to just identify the kind of problem, the algorithm which will fit, fit into this. And I have to just call that algorithm. That's it. It is as simple as that. I have to just call that algorithm. Okay. Yes. Now I have just used age. Now I can have multiple. Now here you have BMI also. I've got skin thickness also, blood pressure also, glucose. And I can develop my predictive models. I can collect a lot of data. I can train my machine. After that, I can validate whether it is able to predict or not. And so Omar is telling, so we are predicting number between 0 to 1 by submitting age only. I was just giving an example, but not necessarily on the age. You can add many features. We call it as features. And this is labeled data again. I can add as many features. And after that, if I have got this data with me, I can say whether what is the probability of this person getting diabetes, 0 0.8, 0 0.7. So if I fit my data there, the machine will predict well probability of you having a diabetes is 60 percent now if there is like i am at 10 percent 20 percent uh, that is not to worry much but if it is 90 and 80 that means well i need to take some action i need to start walking i need to take care of my diet etc so this was just this two algorithms i just uh, talked about uh, we still have time, I think. Uh, yeah, so let me talk about one more algorithm if we are fine. So 
or uh, hurriedly I'll talk about uh, maybe two or three. So this was about, you know, supervised learning. Why we call it supervised learning? Because I am training the machine. No, I'm supervising, I'm training the machine. So I call this as supervised learning. Yeah, supervised learning. Now there is another learning, which is known as unsupervised learning. We call it as unsupervised learning. So supervised learning examples, uh, algorithms for uh, regression and uh, logistic regression, unsupervised learning would be some classification problem. I'll just give a very brief example here. Say, if, suppose this is the population. This point represents a population in a particular district. I'm just keeping it simple so that you can get the answers. You can understand very easily. Now I want to have vaccination centers and let's say I want to have two or let's say three, let's keep it very simple, three vaccination centers. Now there are different possibilities. I can put one vaccination center here so that it's uh, you know close to both this region A, B and C and I can put one here and one here. Yeah, there, there are multiple possibilities. Which is the best possibility? This kind of problem is known as clustering problem. Clustering problem means here I use another algorithm like so K means, etc. And what it would do is it will tell me, well, the three locations of your vaccination centers are this because the distance is minimized with these three locations. So it will find those three locations for you. You just call the relevant function. Understand the kind of problem. You will say, oh, this is a clustering problem. And you just apply that algorithm and you'll get an answer. Another one could be classification. Let's say classification would be something like, let's say I've got this data. I'm just putting color right now, but it could be any feature. It could be any uh, types, could be anything. I want to classify which is one plane. We call it as hyperplane. We Right now I'm talking about support vector machine, SVM, which is a classifier that maximizes the margin here. Support vector machine, we are trying to get optimal hyperplane, like a plane which will divide. So this plane could be anything like, you know, this, uh, it could be this also, it could be this also, it could be this. Which is the best plane which will divide, which will classify this data so that it is, it is equally distant from both the categories. Obviously, this line is the best line. So using support vector machine, I can you know, get that optimal hyperplane, which divides the data into two categories, three categories. In fact, we can have complicated things like, you know, for example, let me ask you, how will I divide this data? For example, the data is like this. data is like this how which plane it's very difficult to find the plane uh, uh, a plane means you know I, I just okay let me draw this plane means like three dimensional plane means like this right so i just you treat as a, 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 a the top view this line was nothing but the plane now can you create a plane very difficult so i will use something called a kernel trick now as i said gee, i'm telling you about the kernel trick i'm telling you about svm you don't have to do anything. You should just know that, oh, I can use kernel trick. Click on the button. There's a button called kernel trick. I'll, I'll show you in, in Python very soon. I'll just show you in just five or 10 minutes. It's so easy. But before that, I'm just preparing you with the theory part so that you can understand that part easily. So what I will do, 
let's say this was the data right so in three dimensions if i'm trying to create like let me create this in three dimension this is like so the green ones are like this that i'm spacing out the two data sets in multiple dimensions and this plane which is coming between can classify we are we call it a skernel trick now these are you know i'm just giving you the way of identifying the algorithm example for clustering and then the third learning which is known as reinforcement learning reinforcement learning is something like uh, the one i give an example of a child learns by looking at the chocolate so the best way to see this is i think uh, look at this robot how it is getting trained now i tell this robot so what right now reinforcement means if you are doing a good job it will be reinforced i'll give you additional points and if you are not doing a good job i'll give you negative points so now i leave this robot i, I construct a robot and leave it in the environment and i tell please learn by yourself so it is trying its best it's trying a lot of uh, permutations and combinations and based on these and you want to remember don't have to remember these formula i'm just saying a simple formula would be if you are walking plus one you are falling down minus two if you are falling very badly minus five okay now mr robot please go ahead what will you see after some time it is trying to maximize those scores first it will fall down but after some time it will start learning from its failures and not only from your uh, its own failure sometimes you can connect this to other robots who are also learning so multiple like so many robots is learning from multiple uh, uh, friends robotic friends and then after some time you start it's running and not only running but running so fast it can beat any human being and it can happen in just few hours of time maybe four hours five hours sometimes 12 hours so this is the kind of applications we are looking at artificial intelligence. Let me uh, talk about uh, one uh, uh, a laptop very easily. Uh, those who are interested, I can tell you how can you do that. Just go to, just type in Anaconda distribution in your Google. Just go to Google, type Anaconda distribution, and just click on download. Download for Windows or download for Apple computers, if you've got Mac, and choose your uh, relevant uh, configuration. And after that, once you download, install it. It's very easy to install. It's like any other uh, computer program you download and install. It will give you all the instructions. And then after it gets installed, you will get a Jupyter notebook. You get a Jupyter notebook, which, which looks something like this. And now you can create a new notebook and you can start writing your program very, very easily. Like for example, I'll say print, print, uh, what do you want? Print means write. So here you have to learn those things. Print means write. So print, um, welcome to the world of AI and data science. Okay. And if I run, if I just run it, it will print, it will write, welcome to the world of AI and data science. Another thing, if X is equal to 20 and Y is equal to, let's say 50, print. what x plus y okay let us see i'm asking print x plus y and let us see oh it is 70. now i'm just using simple things so that you understand 
it is as simple as it. it's like english language that is why even school kids are learning python nowadays now i understand that many of you have got 20 years experience 30 experience uh we are resistant to change oh this is not my age of learning please understand that the new kids on the blog which are coming out of schools they would be much much more smarter than you if you don't try your hands on these simple programming languages otherwise you will get very easily impressed but now if you are aware of this you will be able to ask the right questions in fact you don't have to write programs but you can hire people who can write programs but you'll have to tell them because if you have got the knowledge of the capabilities of these applications or softwares you will be able to guide them direct them as a physician you'll say i i would like to i'm demanding that you please write a program like this i'm demanding you i have got the data please uh, you give me a regression model keep please give me a lo uh, binary logistic uh, regression model or please uh, apply svm here or at least you will ask the right questions so that is the kind of uh, you know future we are uh, you know looking into at this point of time uh, I, I i would have because of the lack so i see my colleague uh, who's like as i told you is working on very advanced applications uh, he has joined and uh, uh, hi rishabh so and now uh, as i told uh, 70% of people here are totally new to data science and 30% have previously attended some workshop so this is for the remaining 30% let us see in fact not only 30 everyone can see that what are the advanced uh, applications uh, which uh, are possible using data science so uh, yeah over to you prana uh, risha thank you uh, yeah. so hi everyone myself risha and thank you everybody for joining <clears throat> So uh, today I'm going to kind of show you uh, one of the advanced application of uh, data science or machine learning. And it's been there like uh, in every domain as I keep on uh, uh, saying, it's uh, not limited to healthcare. It can be utilized in HR analytics, detail. Already you have a basic idea, right? That how these things works. <clears throat> so apart from the so far you whatever example you have seen those are all the structured data example so you are dealing with a very structured data where you have a particular row column you have an x x1 x2 x3 x like blah blah xn and you have the other side you have the y target right so you are utilizing these features x1, x2, x3, x until xn, and you are trying to build your uh, try to predict your y target. Okay, let's say predicting the price of house. So x1 can be the area of the um, uh, area of the room. X2 can be the number of rooms. X3 can be near whether there is a nearby hospital or nursing facility available or not. X4 can be something else. So like that X1, X2, X3, X4, these are all your set of features that you have. And utilizing those features, you are applying either regression, logistic regression, so far you have seen. You are applying and you are predicting your Y target. So this is what is uh, so far being handling with the structured data. While you go for an unstructured data, things gets changed. Okay, for unstructured data, it goes towards um, handling lot of information together, and lot of information along with a lot of different dynamics as well. So, for an example, if I try to extract some pattern from a given image, okay. So let's say this is your image. I want to extract the pattern from a given image. So what I need to do, first I need to represent that image in a mathematical form. Okay. We will take that image and we'll try to represent that image in a mathematical form. And that what is known as pixels. 
so we utilize pixel to represent the entire thing in a mathematical form and then once we util once we take this pixel train our entire data set right so we basically take this pixel now <clears throat> taking an image there are three channels means a image is basically a three dimensional data okay means when you take an image you feel like it's just an image but it has actually three channels means there are two type of image one is black and white image which doesn't doesn't have any channels another is you have a colorful image which have some set of channels what what do you mean by channel channel means it's an array okay like you you have you might have learned in your school days matrices right you have learned matrices there are certain values over here 2 4 6 7 8 2 8 6 4 like that you have certain values here so these values are basically represented in form of pixels okay as i have written only 2 4 6 8 this is just to represent a array or a matrix so like this you have all the pixel values you have heard like megapixel right <clears throat> 10 megapixel 20 megapixel nowadays our cameras are of 100 megapixel right so it is able to capture those many pixel together at the same time at a single instance we are able to capture those many pixels and then put into these images make use of these images and further um, build a computer vision models okay so i will teach i will tell you about the computer vision model later on as of now an image is nothing but it's a matrix of pixel what is it it's a matrix of pixel this pixel is basically varying between 0 to 255 okay <clears throat> 0 being the most darkest pixel means all the black or dark color is basically being defined by 0 255 is most brightest pixel means the one which is uh, very bright very colorful so that is known as so 0 being the most darkest and 255 is the most brightest pixel clear so these are the range of pixel 0 to 255 so you basically make use of this range of pixel to fill up all the colors now you can see so many different colors are there in, in a given image you can have any different set of colors these colors are formed using these three channels that's why these channels are used so let's say red color green color yellow color blue color okay cyan colored any color you can form by utilizing this three channels okay each channel will have a set of pixel values between 0 to 255 now an image will have a specific height it will have a specific width okay and based upon that those many pixel values will be there use utilizing this three channel one channel is red another channel is green and another channel is blue red green blue okay i will take up the questions no worries so red green blue red is basically defining more strength toward red color green is defining more strength towards green color blue is defining more strength towards blue color okay so red green blue when we combine these three things we generate any given color okay you can generate any given color when you combine these three how many color you can generate 255 to the power three these many colors you can generate out of these three channel so utilizing these three channels you can generate any given color clear so you take an image okay you first read that image in form of this matrix of pixels and it has three dimensions okay 
means it's a 3D matrix. Okay, first one is one matrix, then green matrix, then blue matrix. All three are combined together. So this is how an image is represented. So today our use case is determining the brain tumors with the help of neural networks. Now what is neural network? Neural network is basically nothing but it's like the very which way our brain works. Our brain has multiple set of neurons, okay, which are trained over everyday circumstances. So as of now, what, whatever I am teaching you, whatever, whatever I am explaining you, you are getting trained, okay? And over a period of time, you will be able to kind of uh, get a lot of information accumulated. So you make use of those information together and further build out a model, okay? So neural network consists of three things. One is you have your neurons, which get trained on a particular circumstances. So for an example, if I ask you, can you remember your last birthday? How did you celebrate? Can you guys remember your last birthday? How did you celebrate? Can you all recall your last birthday? You cannot recall, okay. Okay, with family, okay, great. Who else can recall? Last birthday, how did you celebrate? What food you had, okay? What all things you have done? Can you all remember last birthday? <clears throat> or let's say some events where you go like with your friends, okay? Let's see your friend's marriage or let's see your friend's birthday, right? Or maybe your family, somebody's marriage. So these are something that everybody can remember more or less, okay? But if I ask you last five days ago, can you recall what food you had? You'll not be able to recall so easily. Or last 10 days ago, what food you had? Can you recall? Your answer would be most of the time no. Okay. Until you had something very special last 10 days ago, you won't, you won't be able to remember that. But you will be able to recall your childhood few moments, but you will not be able to recall last six, seven days what you had. Okay. In your lunch or dinner or whatever it is. The reason is our brain doesn't give importance to each and every event. We don't memorize. We don't have a capability to memorize. We have a capability to give weightage to certain events. And then slowly, slowly our body and our mind and our brain all get to work together. Our entire body is giving input to our brain. Okay, Where the brain is processing those information learning the experiences okay so on the first day let's say you are given a car you will not able to drive you need some support from the driver who, who know how to drive the car on the second day you improve a bit on the third day you further improve on the fourth day you you can drive alone okay without any assistant or help like that over a period of time over let's say one week, 10 days, you will be able to drive much better and much easier, right? So all those are basically getting learned. Your, your neurons in your brain are basically learning those um, actions, learning those experiences that is been given by your rest of the body and rest of the senses, like your eyes, ears, okay, hands, legs, everything. And how to control them is being learned. That is what that is what it is required in driving, right? How to control our organs, okay, our hands and our legs, okay, specifically for a four-wheeler drive, right? We need a kind of a 
multifunctional control. You need a hand control. You need a leg control. Okay. You also need a lot of things to be kind of precisely working, right? While you drive. So all of these gets with a <clears throat> lot of information coming together. And finally, your mind is, your um, uh, neurons in your brain is getting trained. Okay. And it keeps on improving over a period of time as much as we practice those uh, links and those experiences gets more and more uh, trained with your neurons, brain neurons. So we give importance to only those things which we need it or which we feel it to give an importance. Rather, on a daily activity, there are so many things we do, but not to everything we give less importance. You come through a road, okay, let's say you go to your office or you go to your college or you go to your school, whatever it is. Okay, on the road, on the way, you don't remember each and every instances. You only remember some of the instances of the entire day. And again, after one or two days, you will forget whatever experiences you had gone through. Okay. So <clears throat> it is because we don't give importance to everything. So all the inputs are measured with certain weightage. Okay. I gave all these examples to explain you that all these input has certain weightage. Weightage is given to those input where we pay concentration. Okay, where we feel that, yeah, this is important to me. So over there, you give more weightage. So the formula becomes weight into input. For every input, there is a weight. Weight may be lesser, weight may be higher. Higher weight means we are giving more importance. Lower weight means we are giving less importance. Then comes the bias factor. What is bias? Bias is nothing, a very simple thing. Like, let's say you go to your school. Uh, uh, you remember your school days. Okay, let's say you are given a question, MCQ question, right? Four questions, uh, one question is there and there are four points out of which you need to answer either one of them. Okay, one question with four points. Now what happens? Let's say you don't know the question itself. So what you will do? We will start figuring out which is the best answer between the question and these four points. You don't know what is the answer. You want to guess it out and you want to just figure, read the question and find more relativity, which is more related. Okay. Some sort of unsupervised learning. You never learned. You don't know the things. Try to figure out whether there is a minimum uh, difference between the context and the between the question and the answer, right? So similar thing, our brain works in that way. And you might feel that the, the second value, the second point is the answer, okay? You don't know what, what is the perfect answer, but by reading the second point, you feel that you know, this is the best answer. Now what happens? <clears throat> this is what is known as bias, okay? So how does bias works? Bias feels that this is the best fit value so far. Okay. Means <clears throat> this is how you basically, you take the data, you read the data. Okay. You see these four answers. Second point you find more relativity. You don't have any specific reason. You don't have any weights because you have never learned. So you don't have any weights. You, have, you just read, you felt that, yeah, this may be the answer, okay? And you have simply ticked that one, okay? So this is known as bias. There are many things in human being do take decision with bias. When human being doesn't know the things properly, okay, they try to assume a lot of things, right? Let's say you don't know an answer, you start piling up some information here and there, and then you say the answer, right? So that's what happens with neural networks as well. Okay, those who don't know the things, they start piling it up. Okay, so piling it up or make some assumptions. Okay, that if these kind of words are present, means this is an answer. So there are some facts where people do also human being take a lot of biasness. Like you know that smoking is injurious to health, but still human beings smoke, right? 
so why they are a bit biased with some sort of elements right so this is known as biasness and this also comes in machine learning models or deep learning models so you get weight which is very important factor into input plus bias now all these these two entire thing works so efficiently you can see it works with our brain as well okay let's say you don't have any weight means you don't have any knowledge on the input that has came okay you are adding bias you are adding some assumptions okay when you have a sufficient weight you are multiplying with your input okay your bias component by default is lower okay so weight gives more importance to your input when you have lesser importance of weight you get more impact of bias when you have get more impact of weights you get lesser impact of bias so it's a kind of a vice versa helping to take certain decision okay and all of these things passes through an activation function so what is activation function let's say you have so many things going on right means let's say while you are driving okay whether to move right or left there are five vehicles let's say you are driving like this let's say this is your car and this is another car this is another car and let's say this is another car so this becomes one input this is my input i1 this is my input i2 this is my input i3 so we have a respective weight weight into input i1 plus bias weight 2 into input i2 plus bias weight 3 into input i3 plus bias so all of them have individual weights but how much acceleration you will make will depend upon either three of these vehicle right so which one you will focus more the middle one right because the distance is lesser where the distance is bit far away from here and far away from here while i3 is my more focus so the weightage for i3 will be bit higher because it is having a lesser distance okay where the weightage for i2 and i1 will be vary right so whichever get highest that's i3 get highest right so this will get triggered to make your decision this triggering is known as activation function means activate this particular weight and bias to make your decision okay that for based upon this three vehicle i1 i2 i3 okay how much acceleration you should do so that you don't collide with this vehicle or whether you should go left right okay or whether how much clutch you should put so that you don't go and collide with this spec clear so this is known as activation function you get so many inputs and you need to prioritize any one of those which has got a larger weight larger contribution and based upon that you make your predicts so the final formula stands over here is activation function weight into input plus bias this is your final formula activation function weight into input plus bias using this uh, uh using this uh, this is one neuron formula okay like this we will have multiple neurons whichever get activates you basically utilize that inputs so using this you go ahead and train your entire model okay so this is how our brain works at the same time the same thing got replicated in the formula you see this is a formula okay so this alpha is activation function and weight into input plus bias as i explained right so you convert your biological neuron to an artificial neuron okay now we make use of this artificial neuron to identify whether a brain is having a tumor or whether a brain is not having a tumor okay so let us directly come to the problem statement and see how does it works okay so you can see that this is the brain a ct scan uh, image 
where you can see that this is the tumor present over here. Okay. So this is what we need to identify. And in the healthy brain, you will not get to see this tumor. Typically in the um, tumor driven brain, you will means where you will get either tumor. Now tumors are basically of two types. Okay, one is malignant, means that is cancerous. Another is benzene, which is non-cancerous tumor. But again, over a period of time, benzene can get infected and get into a malignant state. Okay, so um, tumor can be of any type. Our objective is not to segregate between benzene and malignant. Our objective is just to determine whether a tumor is present or not. Okay. So we are reading the image. You can see we are reading the image. Now what I said, image is of three channels. You see three dimensional results we got. Means 255 means basically the height is of 255, 225. The width is also 225. Okay. And there are three channels. Means there are three RGB channels. Clear? There are three RGB channels. That's why this three is over here. Height, width, and there are three channels. Okay, so uh, this is how we read the images, and then we started labeling them. Okay, so we, we are having two folder. In one folder, we are having all the images which are associated with tumor, and another folder where we have all the images which are associated not with tumor, means where we have healthy images. So we are reading from yes path folder to label all the images as yes, they are having tumor. And we are reading from a healthy path folder, healthy CT scan brain path folder, where we are labeling all the images as no by stating that they are healthy. Okay. So these two are very important. And um, you can see each and every image path we have taken and we have labeled it yes, no. Now the next thing is we are trying to plot multiple images together to see how the data looks like overall. And the first instance, we just plotted one image. Here we are plotting multiple image. Okay. So you can see some of the brains having a tumor. Some of the brains are healthy. This is 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 healthy. Some of them are having tumor. Okay. Now what we are doing is we are trying to scale these images. Means First of all, these images are very straightforward. Means the brain is situated like this, like, right? <clears throat> so this is our Northern hemisphere. This is our South hemisphere. We say like that. So what happens? Most of the time your direction is like this. The brain direction is like this. What happens if yeah, these are the uh, of a single brain only. Okay, means single brain with means one image for one brain, one image for one brain. Again, you have another image for another brain. Okay, so total one fifty brain images are there. The data size is very less. Just to see as an example, so one image is one brain. It is not like a multiple slide of a single brain. No. One image, one brain of one patient. Okay. So you can see the segment of the brain images are always like this. Okay. The arrow is like this. Okay. But what happens if the brain image looks like this? Or what happens if the brain image is in a different directions, in an opposite directions? The model might not be able to learn that. Okay. Because it has always been trained in a single direction. Okay, let's say if I teach you always to uh, drive in a forward manner. Okay, if I only teach you to drive a car in a forward manner. Okay, if I don't teach you how to uh, move the car in a backward slide. Okay, you will not be able to learn that. You will be only able to learn forward and forward. You will not be able to uh, uh, drive the car in a reverse gear. Right. So similarly, here also what we are doing is we are trying to rotate the image, taking the image, trying to rotate left, right, back. Okay. So that's what we are doing over here. 
in this piece of code. We are trying to rotate our entire image and try to see that first we are splitting the data, train test, and then we are trying to rotate. If you see over here, so the entire image is rotated. You see, it is rotated. Okay. It is no longer always straightforward. It is no longer like this. Okay. It is like this. Okay. Some of them is diagonal as well. So this helps us the model, our deep learning model to learn these things very dynamically. Okay. And then finally, we apply convolution neural network. So it's a neural, it's a type of neural network, the one which I explained. Neural network is very vast. Okay. So I just gave you a, a, a smaller understanding of it, that how does it work? Now we change that formula based upon our need. So for handling images, we make use of convolution neural network. So that is another type of neural network which only works with images. Okay, images as well as there is a concept of spatial features. Over there only it works. Okay, so I will say only images as of now. Okay. So neural convolution neural network, they can only handle images and they work with the images. So we have used one of the model, okay, convolution neural level. So this is our convolution neural network, which is getting trained on these entire set of images to classify between brain with tumors and brain without tumors. Clear? So, <clears throat> Once we train that, then finally, um, you can see that the training takes a lot of time. So we are able to, with the five iteration, means in one iteration, it will learn. So how the training happens? So let me give you an um, understanding. In one iteration, the model will get trained. And whichever mistakes it makes in prediction, in the next iteration, we try to give importance to those mistakes. Like in the first day, you, you are driving a car. Okay, you made some mistake. Your driver come and say that, no, you have to ride, you have to drive in a, this manner, right? So it is very similar like that, okay? First, you make mistakes. Then we give importance to those mistakes, try to rectify those. And again, train, okay? Again, you go back to the next day in your driving. Again, if you make mistakes, again, the driver will tell that you need to, uh, check this, check that. Then again, on the third day, the driver will tell, you need to do this, you need to do that. And like that, on a daily basis, you will be able to, you will be slowly able to learn everything. Okay. So this is what <coughs> is known as <coughs> model training. So you can say only five times it got trained. We are into an accuracy of 69%. Uh, Okay, our accuracy is at 69%. Over a period of time, it will slowly improve. Okay, means after, let's say, having 20 epochs, epochs means iterations, 20 set of iterations or 30 set of iterations, our model will definitely improve. <clears throat> Clear? So, this is how it works and then finally, once the model is created, we uh, try to put this model in a, uh, we try to deploy these models, okay, using DevOps tools and all, okay, there are many things post that. And we share, we try to tie this with any of the application, okay, where it can automatically detect the brain tumors. You don't need any radiologist to come and sit and determine whether there is a brain tumor there or not. Clear? Any questions? Yes. There are many new things that I got introduced to you guys, okay, which we teach in depth in our course. Here we are just to give you an understanding how to build this. I briefly mentioned, I try to touch base few things. Okay. Yeah. Any questions, any doubts that you have?
Okay, so if there are no questions, then I think uh, what we can do. So as we said, like, you know, in the initial stages, we started from ground zero. And uh, we, you know, so and so some of you would be interested, like, do, can, can I have a quick uh, a poll? Uh, you know? Okay, so here we have around uh, almost uh, hundred percent of people are showing interest. That's that's good, and uh, many of you are interested to attend uh, very soon. So we'll send you the details. In fact, my team can put a link, and uh, you can get a register for the uh, for the training. We'll be happy to uh, you know uh, send you the details uh, of this. And uh, I just to tell you that uh, that these are the dates. In fact, we're starting one batch very soon this Friday. So if you'd like to join, feel free to join training on weekdays. Next batch. Uh, so hurry, hurry up. And uh, there is some special offer going on, New Year offer. So uh, please join us. Uh, this uh, uh, register in the, the, here we have given a link in the chat box. You can register. And also we keep doing uh, free workshops. Uh, some of our upcoming workshops are uh, as follows. You can uh, appear, you can attend one workshop tomorrow. This PMP workshop, CPHQ workshop, Yellow Build, Lean Six Sigma Yellow Build training on 24th January, Data Science training on 19th January. Again, one more time, Power BI training on 14th January. These are all free web webinars. Do attend them and uh, join us. So once again, we would like to invite you. These are the timings of our training programs for uh, Data Science Batch starting on uh, Friday. So usually we have Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Uh, that's all. The, 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 these are the usual days. And next week and then. Very soon. So, uh, yes, on that note, uh, we would like to thank everyone. And uh, I hope you gained some good information from this uh, uh, session. And uh, those who have attended the full program, they'll be receiving a certificate. So you will receive a certificate of attendance. And uh, yes, uh, see you soon. Any questions? We are open to questions. Please go ahead. So just to remind you, in the first one, one, one hour, 15 minutes, we talked about very basics and the last 45 minutes, we talked about very, very advanced applications. And we will make you, we'll start with ground zero and then, of course, make you a hero. So that's the whole idea. So looking forward to see you soon in our meetings, in our next training programs. And hurry up. This batch, we have got some special offers going on, your offer, as I said. So get hold of that. Thanks a lot.